I want you to go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28 if you have them. Uh, if you have uh, an iPhone with a Bible, it's Matthew 28. It's the very first book of the New Testament. And we're going to go ahead and read 10 verses out of there. But before we do that, he is risen. He is risen I, the first time I celebrated Easter with Newport Mesa Church, I said, he is risen. I said, <laughs> I said he is risen. And I discovered that this church says that back, and then I discovered that they've been doing that for, I guess, centuries. So I was late to the party, but welcome to the Easter party, and uh, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you're welcome. From whatever part of the world you're from, you're welcome. Whatever language you speak, you're welcome. Whatever you look like, you're welcome. Whether you're rich or poor, you're welcome. Do you get the point? We're just glad that you're here, because Jesus has a message for you. And don't miss this. God wants you to be a part of his family. He is so proud of you. He loves you so much. He's done so much to get your attention. We're going to look at that this morning. I believe there's one question that all of us are here to answer. And it's not just this morning. It's not just this week. It's really the question that burns in our heart. And we're trying to figure out what it means for life. And that question is, what am I searching for? We try to fill that void with so many different ways, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's people or objects or materialism or a career. And that question is a question that all of us are trying to figure out. Now, I know what the kids are looking for, right? What are they searching for? Eggs. I mean, today is Easter, for goodness sakes. They're going to be going out and doing this egg hunt, and they are going to be making the rest of your all days very interesting because they're going to be running on a very high-end sugar diet. Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) It's Easter, y'all. Like this, this is one of those holidays where they can eat sugar, and it's it's because of Jesus. So you have him to blame. But we're so glad you're here, and that question is the question that I really want us to think about as we dig dig deeper into this text. What are you searching for? Is it significance? Is it a relationship? Is it identity? Are you searching for purpose? Meaning? God has a message for you today, and it's found in the text. I want to process it. And invite you into the journey with me. Matthew 28 starts in verse 1. It says, early on Sunday morning. This would be today and why we celebrate on Sundays in general. As the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. It's significant that Jesus raises and elevates the status of women. Because they are the eyewitnesses of his resurrection. The first, according to Matthew's account. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Rolled aside the stone. And sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's white. (laughs) Indicating the purity of this being, of this form. The purity of this being. Verse 4. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. When the angel spoke to the women, he said, don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus. We're all on that search, aren't we? Wherever you're... Wherever you're coming from in that question, you're joining a whole congregation of people who is on that search, and it's a spiritual journey for Christ. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, and we spent Friday night experiencing a very powerful service. We call it a Good Friday service. If you were here Friday night, you know that we experienced the spiritual significance of Christ's death, his death on the cross. Verse 6, this is what the angel said. He isn't here. He is risen. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. You know, one of the things that I love about God that I have personally experienced is that he invites us into the investigation of the claims of Christ. Did Jesus really rise from the grave? Now, I don't know where you are, where you are in your spiritual journey, but I know that if you're like me, you want to know, did Jesus really rise from the grave? What connection does these eggs have to Jesus rising from the grave? And this egg hunt and these chocolate bunnies, and what is the significance as I, as a, as a husband and a father, try to take my family through a, a significant spiritual holiday? Did this really happen, or are we just building our whole thing here on corporate, on a business, on 
Or is there something for our families to discover as a family this morning? And God invites us in to the investigation. He invites us in to the journey. And let me just tell you, he's not afraid of whatever it is that you're questioning. Last year we had a service and we called it Doubter's Welcome. And we talked about how Jesus met Thomas right where he was. And Jesus answered Thomas's questions. What questions do you honestly have that only Christ can answer? The questions that come from that base part of your soul that you know cannot be met anywhere except for God. Jesus wants to answer those questions this morning. A couple years ago I took my first trip to Israel and... I wanted to investigate the land where Jesus was. And we went to this place called the Garden Tomb. And this is, uh, is one of the places in Jerusalem, near Jerusalem, where you can visit. And guess what you're going to find there? An empty tomb. It's an empty tomb. Like, there's no body there. Now, of course, our faith is not built on the present-day empty tomb of Jesus, right? We have to build our faith on reasonable clues that God gives us. It's not just the personal revelation of Christ but God wants us to use our brains. Maybe some of you grew up in an environment where that was discouraged. But Jesus wants you to use all of your brains to figure out who he is. Because how will you worship him with all of your heart, with all of your strength, and with all of your minds if you don't worship God with your minds? And when I went to Israel, I discovered this empty tomb. And it wasn't proof to me, but it did give me an indication that this was a belief that they believed in this moment, that Jesus' body was not there. These two women were the first to discover that there was no body there. They got this message from this angel. Now, I don't know what you're thinking. Maybe you're thinking there could be other ways of, of explaining the situation. Maybe it was the wrong tomb. Maybe it was the wrong tomb. But because of the inclusion of the name Joseph of Arimathea, who was a well-known member of the Jewish leadership structure, it couldn't have been the wrong tomb. He was too well-known. It couldn't have been the wrong tomb. Maybe Jesus didn't really die. But if you're here Friday night, you know the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. In fact, in John 19, 33 through 34, when the Roman soldiers came by, which was customary to literally break the legs of the prisoners who were dying on the cross so that they would eventually suffocate, they didn't need to do that. They just speared Christ because he was literally already dead. And for three days, Jesus was in this tomb, really dead. So he really was dead. Or maybe you think there's another explanation. Maybe they, they stole him. And, and, and it indicates that this was a rumor that was consistent and common back then. In verses 11 15, it talks about how the Jewish leadership structure uh, paid these soldiers to... to to tell that rumor. The problem is, if the Romans had stolen the body, all they would have had to have done was bring the body out. If the Jews had stolen the body, all they would have done to squash this rumor forever is bring the body of Christ out. But here's the most disturbing one. If the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus, why in, they, why in the world would they have died for the lie of trying to keep this movement from being thwarted? You see, the eyewitnesses, these early ones who really saw the situation, the empty tomb and the risen Christ, they actually struggled to believe the implications of it. It was difficult for them to embrace it. But because Jesus really died and was really raised from death to life, we know, we can put our faith and trust, that the change that we saw take place in these early disciples was at least and is at least something for us to really consider. I mean, think about this, and maybe you're here thinking people die all the time for a lie. They're called suicide bombers, right? They, they, this, this crazy idea that if, that if you go and blow up a coffee shop, shop that somehow, you know, it's going to be rewarded to you. Here's the difference, and this is so key in our understanding this, as this early lie became more and more prevalent, is that people who are dying for these causes believe them to be true. They really believe. So if the disciples had really stolen the body, think about the implications, they would be inviting themselves to enter a lifelong of persecution and suffering. Who would die for a lie? 
if you really know that it's not true, why in the world would we embrace a lie, live for that lie, and then be willing to be persecuted and die for it? These are part of the reasons why I really consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be something to be considered. Not that Jesus doesn't plant faith in my heart and it's a spiritual rebirth that happens, but certainly part of the process. Another part of my own journey and search has been just the recognition of skeptics converting. Paul was the original skeptic. I mean, he wanted to squash Christianity, didn't he? In fact, he persecuted Christians for trying to promote this theory that Jesus actually was raised from the dead. And yet he had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and his life was changed forever. But was it, and is it, just limited to Paul? Let me read you a a quote by a man named Ian Hutchison. He says this, I'm a professor of nuclear science and engineering at MIT. Anybody know about MIT? (laughs) And I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so do dozens of my colleagues. I don't know if that surprises you to think or to embrace the fact that there are a lot of really smart people who have come to faith in Jesus really dying and being really truly raised from the grave. Not just because of the circumstantial or historical reasons, but because of Christ's revelation to them. At 10.30 today, I posted an article on our Facebook page. Go to the Facebook page and read the article. You can read all of his reasons for believing. Because God invites you into the investigation. You don't have to sit there and think and just take my word for it. You've got Google, for goodness sakes. So, you can use it. This is what he says at the end of the article. This is Ian again, the, the nuclear scientist and engineer at MIT. He said, if you've read thus far and you're still wondering how an MIT professor could seriously believe in the resurrection, you might guess I was brainwashed to believe it as a child. Can I be honest? There have been moments in my life that I thought Christians were just brainwashed. The skeptic in me thought so and believed so. He goes on to say, but no, I did not grow up in a home where I was taught to believe in the resurrection. I came to faith in Jesus when I was an undergrad at Cambridge University and was baptized in the chapel of King's College on my 20th birthday. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus are as compelling to me now as then. You know, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, there's always more to discover. And I think that sense and that idea of being humble and open to what God wants to speak to us and to open our heart to what God wants to say to us and to consider and to weigh the factors that led to these early believers to willingly give their lives for this truth, for this person, it's compelling. And I just want you to know that God's not afraid of your doubts. He's not afraid of your fear. But he wants you to come and investigate the claims so that you can be impacted by what Jesus has to say. But this is a process, isn't it? And there's this tension of trying to figure out, did it happen? And even the more important question for us to consider today is why is it so significant? Why is the resurrection of Jesus so significant? Simon Sinek, the famous business guy, says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. You know where he got that from? Jesus. (laughs) Because all good, everything comes from Jesus. And Jesus didn't just die for you. He did it for a specific reason. A lot of specific reasons. And we're going to see it played out in the tension that we see between these two women. Let's go ahead and continue to read. Verse 7, it says, And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. So this is the angel speaking to the two Marys. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. Here's the tension. And they were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. In the journey and the search for what we're trying to discover, I know that there is tension. You might hear something like, there were eyewitnesses, and it's hard for you to connect to it because there's distance. How many of you remember In 1987, a song by U2 that referenced the journey of trying to figure out and find something that they hadn't looked for, right? 
And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Now you know why I'm not seeing up there. <laughs> Just curious, how old were you in 1987? I was seven years old, so I just told you how old I am. <laughs> Isn't it crazy to consider that that event happened 30, over 31 years ago? And yet no one disputes me. They were there, right? You were there. You know that you two wrote that song. You're not going to dispute it. And yet we struggle with the tension of this idea of eyewitnesses because we weren't there. And yet when this when this rumor began to, be, uh, began to be opposed by Paul 25 years later in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, and they're still dealing with this tension of did it really happen, he references not only his interaction with Christ, but Peter's and the eyewitnesses and over 500 people. Because the reality is it's a hard reality to embrace. It's outside of our experience. It's not normal. And there is a tension. There's this tension between fear and joy. Did this really happen? And what does it mean for me? What does it mean for me? If there's anything that you leave today with, I want you to leave with these three realities that the resurrection unlocks for you. Here's the reality. These women expected Jesus to do what dead people do. Stay dead. <laughs> but he didn't. He, re he resurrected himself. And because he resurrected himself, it means something for us. This is what it means. First, it means that we have hope. That death has been defeated. Friends, this is part of the reason why we call funerals celebrations of life in the Christian faith. Because while we're sad at the temporary disconnect that we have from this person that we've loved... We know that that person is with Jesus, and that is the hope of the resurrection. There is an empty tomb, and because there's an empty tomb, my, my empty heart can be filled with hope because death has been defeated. If you've lost a loved one, if you've lost a child or an infant, they are with Christ, and trust me, they don't want to come back. As much as I know that you love them, and, and, and I know that it's painful, they are in the, the abs that's where we're going. And that's where our, where our hearts will be fulfilled by our relationship with Christ. This is exactly where they are. This gives us hope. Death has been defeated. It doesn't mean that death doesn't happen. It, it means it, it's been defeated. The sting of the permanence of death is no longer here. Last week, before, right before I got up to preach the Paul message sermon, I looked down at my phone. Don't look at text messages or phone right before you preach. Bad idea. And I saw that my uncle Rick Seward had passed away in a tragic car accident in Brazil, of all places. Now, he was my dad's first cousin, but we just grew up calling him Uncle Rick. And while it has been kind of a hard reality for me to face, I also know that Rick was a man of faith, that his hope was in Jesus. He was a part of a church that grew super healthy, and they've planted, no joke, 10,000 churches in 40 years. And he was a man who gave his life to the cause, to the person of Jesus. And because he gave his life to the person of Jesus, he had hope. And no matter who you are, no matter what spiritual accolades you have, if you have a relationship with Jesus, and because Jesus really was raised from the grave, you have hope. Because Christ's victory was for you so that you could have hope. Second, we have forgiveness. We live as forgiven people. When I graduated from college, I moved to Hawaii, and I did this discipleship training school with an organization, uh, with a missionary couple that was with YWAM. They were no longer with YWAM, but they did a lot of similar things. And I met an older guy who, I, I, I've mentioned this to our congregation before, but the first time I met him, his hands were just lifted up in worship. There were tears in his eyes, and he, he just, like, there was just this, 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 uh, this reverence and honor that I, it just, it, I could feel it and sense the true worship that I saw in him. I got to know him later, and he told me that he had been addicted to heroin for 30 years. And when he met Jesus, he said he never had experienced the feelings of being forgiven. And all, see, heroin addiction or any addiction to anything is just, it's just a symptom to that deeper question that we all ask. God, what am I here for? Who have you called me to be? Are you there? Are we supposed to have a relationship? I'm trying to connect to the way, the order that you've created me. And Bob, which was his name, 
worshipped with the most, the purest form of worship I could ever see. I could ever know. And God healed him. And it wasn't just overnight. It was over a process. There were still things that he struggled with. Reggie could tell you. Reggie knows Bob. Bob was like this angel of a figure. Now, his dog was demon-possessed. I can't guarantee you that you wouldn't have been attacked by his little dog, Eddie. And my goodness, Eddie was, had some serious psychological issues. But so true. But Bob, Bob loved Jesus. And because of Christ's resurrection, Bob had hope and Bob had forgiveness, and he lived like a forgiven man. To much has been forgiven, they forgive much. Isn't it interesting how when God pours grace into our lives for areas that we don't deserve, we want to turn around and pour grace back into other people. That's the message of the gospel, that there is no sin too great that God can't forgive. I don't care how big your sin is. I don't care how much guilt you have or shame. God wants to take that off your shoulders and forgive you. This morning, he died and he was raised from the grave so that you could experience that forgiveness. And finally, we have access to God. We have access to God and we don't even realize what incredible thing this is. John 10, 30 through 33 says this. This is Jesus speaking. I and the Father are one. Oftentimes people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Just hang in there. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which these do you stone me. We are not stoning you for good works, they replied, but for blasphemy, because because you, a mere man, claim to be God. You see, there were conflicts in Jesus' ministry up until this point. It wasn't because Jesus did miracles. It wasn't because Jesus healed people or cast out demons. It was because he claimed something that no other rabbi or teacher claimed. No other prophet claimed. Jesus claimed divinity. He claimed to be God. And why is this important? Why is this incredibly significant for us? Because if God doesn't forgive us of our sins, we stand condemned. Without the forgiveness that only God can offer us, we can no longer or even have the opportunity to pursue the end result of that question. What are you searching for? Jesus wants us to discover what we're searching for. That we have access to God through the resurrection of Jesus. It's the final proof that he can forgive sins. Do you remember that little story in the Gospels where the friends are desperate for their friend to be healed? He's a paralytic, and they, they, they scurry up the roof, and they dig a little hole, and they put him down. And what is the first thing that Jesus does? It's crazy. He says, son, your sins, they're forgiven. Well, the critics freak out because they don't think he should be able to do this. And then he says, but... In order to combat this craziness in these people's, these bystanders' hearts, I'm going to heal you too. Get up, take your mat, go home. Jesus forgives sins not because he's simply been given permission to God to do so. He forgives sins because he's God. And he does not hold any of the ways that we veered from that journey in thought or deed against us. Jesus came. He lived a real human life. He died a real human death. And that's where the similarities end. Because though he raised four people from death to life, he raises himself up from the grave to prove that you and I can have hope, to give us forgiveness, to help us understand that we have access to God. Two weeks ago, I went to Lebanon, and our church is is going to be partnering with World Vision and some missionary organizations in Lebanon to help with the Syrian refugee crisis. How many of you in the last seven years have heard the name ISIS, ISIL? It's been a devastating uh, journey for the Syrians. And when I went there, I saw the direct impact of how much this war and this violence has impacted a people. But the highlight of my trip, the absolute highlight of my trip, and maybe one of the highlights of my life, of my life was worshiping in a church in Arabic, and being in the same space as not only the Lebanese, but the Syrians who had just years before, two decades before, occupied Lebanon, who had been given room, two million 
Syrian refugees in a country of 6 million. Do the math. That's crazy numbers. And there was a large group of Syrians in that church that day. And as I looked at these people who are lifting their hands to worship Jesus, I couldn't help but think about the kinds of things that they had experienced. And at the end of the service, when the pastor gave this, the call for salvation, and when the pastor encouraged the people to lift their hands in worship, there was one woman who, whose voice I didn't understand because I don't speak Arabic. But I could sense it from her emotional connection to God that she was a woman who absolutely 100% believed that God could hear her prayers, that as she poured her heart out to God and wept before that congregation, that she was having a connection. And we have the possibility of that same connection. Do we value it, the freedom to have that connection with God, or will we need a, some sort of tragedy to happen for us to recognize the incredible privilege it is to know God through Christ? You have access to God. The God that created every single one of these stars knows the number of hairs on your head. You cannot tell me he doesn't care for you when he sacrificed his life and died for you and then rose again so that you could experience his love in a tangible way. You can know it this morning. You have access to God. Why is the resurrection significant? Because we live with hope. We don't live as the world does. We don't live as the world does. We live with the hope of Christ's victory. We live in a state of being forgiven, which means we extend forgiveness to people who don't deserve it, just like we didn't deserve it. And just like that Syrian refugee, we live with a constant connection to God. Do you have that constant connection to God? Do you live your life in a way that reflects a bowed heart, a surrendered, intimate, close relationship? I want to show you what I'm talking about. Because these two women, though most of us don't necessarily connect with them, they're, they, they knew Jesus, they lived in that time. We're 20th century, we're so far removed they give us a model for how to respond. Verse 9 says, And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. In our search this morning, I believe an empty tomb can fill an empty heart with hope, forgiveness, and access to God. Now, in a few moments, we're going to do an egg hunt. Let me tell you something. Because it's April Fool's Day, we didn't fill any of the eggs with candy. <laughs> Just to be theologically accurate. Just kidding. We would have mutiny on our hands, right? Don't worry, there's going, to be, there's going to be sugary treats and sugary delights for, really for the adults, because I know that's who's going to be eating the candy today, right? I'm going to be demanding a tithe from Harper, I'm just saying, I, and, and my tithe percentage is 100%. That's what we were, it was at Halloween was 100%, I'm just saying. An empty tomb fills an empty heart with hope, forgiveness, and access to God. You know that word... That word for worship, it means, there's a combination of two words that are merged together. It means towards and it means kiss. So these two women who are trying to figure this out on their search, in their journey, they're battling the tension of whether to believe the significance of it. Did it really happen? I mean, all the same things that we figure out, they do the one thing that I think God wants all of us to do is to come to him with intimacy in mind. That's my definition for worship. It's not, it's not even necessarily about, about what, your, what the outside is doing, whether your hands are up, you're on the ground. It's about what your heart is doing. And if your heart is surrendered to God, if you live your life in a way that reflects a surrendered heart, you please God. And Jesus doesn't correct these women, by the way. Now just think about that. If he wasn't God, that would be the moment where he would have said, hey, because you don't worship someone who's not God. 
And see, so many of us, we're trying to worship all sorts of things with our lives. We've surrendered our lives to good things and bad things, to relationships, to objects, to careers. All sorts of things are pulling at us. They're grabbing at us. And this world is trying to destroy the purpose, the one thing, our identity for which we've been made. To be in communion and relationship with God where nothing else matters. Not that it doesn't matter, but so far in comparison, it's so far second. And let me just tell you, for a long time, I thought getting married, that's, that's going to give me the, the fulfillment that I need. Having a great career, that's going to give me the, the fulfillment that I need. And success, and all of these countries that I, that I want to visit, I'm going to notch them off in my belt. And that's going to be the thing that gives me a sense of, my, of, of fulfillment. And the search that you're on, I'm telling you, that is not how you find fulfillment. And you've got to check this out for yourself. It's not, you, you, you don't, please don't take this from me. Try this out, try this on for size and figure out if it fits. But I have only sensed that ultimate sense of fulfillment when I've surrendered my life to God. My heart has been surrendered to God. Don't, don't, go, don't get caught up by the organizational stuff or, or like, well, yeah, the church just wants my money or, or they're a bunch of hypocrites. Right now, it's just between you and God. It's just between these two women and Jesus. And they just, pro- they, they're there. They laid down before him. They grabbed his feet, his physical feet. He was really resurrected. And it says they worshiped him. That term is used only 12 times in all of the New Testament. It's more than just a song. It it, it signifies that God wants relationship, close relationship with you. That reflects the order of creation. It's okay, we don't have to be God. We let God be God and we honor him by surrendering our lives to him. And, And that's gonna mean something different for all of you. All of the disciples had different destinies. But they all converge because God's ultimately, oh, his ultimate destiny is to be close and near to us. He wants so badly to be close and near to us. My search for an empty tomb has filled my own empty heart, my own skeptical heart, my own cautious heart, my own broken heart, my own hurting heart. It's filled it with hope. There aren't days that I struggle, sure. It's filled it with forgiveness. There are days that I don't forgive, sure. And there are certainly days that I take for granted the the relationship with God that I have. But if I were to be honest with myself and if I were to encourage you this morning with one response, one response would be to invite you to stand up even now. Would be to ask you right even now to stand up. And to respond like these two women who've had their expectations blown. They're trying to figure it all out. (laughs) But in the end, they lean towards him. They get on the ground. They grab his feet. And they worship him. You see, in your search for meaning, I think this is where your heart will come alive. This is where the spirit will pour himself into you and cause something to bloom right out of the darkness, right out of the concrete jungle that you feel like you're pressed in. There is life and God wants to bear it out in you. Would you be willing to surrender your life to Jesus this morning, to surrender your heart, to give yourself to him, to recognize that the promises and the significance of this truth is still true today as it was then. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And I'm gonna ask you to just say this prayer in your heart and nobody knows if it means anything except for God. And that's the greatest part of this prayer is that it really is between you and God. And I'm just going to lift my hands as as the universal sign of surrender or worship. And I'm going to offer my life to God because I do this every day. Again, I'm not perfect. There should be a sign out there that says no perfect people allowed. You don't have to be perfect to be a part of this church. But let's offer ourselves to God in worship. If you'd be willing to do that today, just to take a step of faith, I believe God will fill your heart with the genuineness and authenticity of that prayer and that you can worship God for yourself. 
Father, we need you. We surrender to you. We take a moment and we say we're part of the problem. It's our sin that puts you on the cross, but it was your love that overcame death and sin and sickness. The death that you died could not keep you there because you loved us so much. And it was your love and your glory that burst through that grave. And Father, we commit our lives to you right now. We pray that you would give us salvation, that you would give us hope, the forgiveness of sins, and that we would live a life, that we would live a life that honors the death that you died and the resurrection that took place. Thank you, Jesus, that we have access to resurrection power, not only now, but when we meet you someday, death will not have a sting and we will be with you. In Jesus' name we pray.